Uh, well, so the first question is it too loud? Is it fine? Can you hear me? That's awesome. Thank you. Well, uh, so uh, good morning. Uh, today, so actually, the whole day it will be devoted to quantum computing. And um, if I would be given one hour for uh, this whole quantum computing stuff, I would probably just say, well, it's magic. Uh, if I would have like 30 hours, then I could probably give you a proper course. Uh, in the end, we have uh, five hours of, uh, well, to cover. So the promise or the idea behind the course is to, well, at the first half of the day, so until lunch, give you um, the general understanding how well, well, maybe not how quantum mechanics works, but uh, what are, are the basic rules of uh, quantum mechanics, the postulates, and um, and uh, some small introduction to quantum computing. And in the second half of the day, we'll uh, have to uh, we'll uh, change our focus to um, applications. And uh, the first session will be on quantum machine learning. And uh, we'll close the day with uh, quantum algorithms for remote sensing, which uh, will be a hands-on session uh, covered by Greg. Okay, so probably I should also uh, introduce what me, Arthur. Uh, that's me. Uh, you can <laughs> somehow easily distinguish lecturers today because I'm all white today, and Greg here in audience is all black. <laughs> is it a good and bad cop or something of this arrangement? Uh, so the first step. Uh, oh, you cannot see that. Yeah. Point to point to. No, no. Okay, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. The first part will be covered by me. The one uh, that's uh, try now. Okay. Yeah, okay, whatever. It's not that important in the end. Maybe I can just use some kind of a stick or <laughs> something. Uh, the first part will be covered by me. Uh, then we uh, quantum circuits uh, by Greg. Lunch, very important. And uh, after our belly is full, we'll move to one hour lecture by me again. And we'll finish uh, with a hands on session uh, by Greg. Uh, okay, well, so it's not an easy topic in general, uh, and I hope you have a long night of rest and no sleep. Uh, no beers yesterday or anything like this, right? Um, and somehow to give you some kind of an incentive to well stay away and um, keep your focus, we um, had an idea to actually throughout the whole day, perform a quiz. Okay. <laughs> well, we have to go through that. Well, it will be useful uh, in a moment. So, uh, the thing is that the uh, whole language of quantum me mechanics, the mathematical language of quantum mechanics, um, uses complex numbers. And if you remember your first year of studies, that's good, and probably you remember uh, the whole thing, but uh, I've included like three, I think, slides of uh, repetition of the basic ideas. Uh, so a complex number consists of two parts, the real part and the imaginary part. Uh, the imaginary, in front of the imaginary part, we put uh, imaginary unit. Uh, the imaginary unit, well, it can be seen as a square root of minus one, okay, but the more Let's say fundamental, fun, fundamental and useful thing is that i squared is equal to minus one. Um, we, well, uh, we can uh, perform some basic operations on complex numbers. Uh, first, uh, on a, uh, on a, with a single complex number, we can perform conjugation that I will mark with a star, and it just changes the sign of the imaginary part. We can, uh, with this conjugation, we can, for example, easily compute the real part or algorithmically compute the real part and imaginary part of this number by uh, just taking the average of the uh, sum of uh, the, uh, the complex number and its conjugate or the difference. Okay. So, uh, 
about the basic operations on multiple numbers, we can add them and it's extremely easy. You just add real parts together and add imaginary parts. And well, the multiplication is a little bit harder. Well, but if you just use the standard multiplication rules, the real parts uh, are multiplied together. The imaginary part are also multiplied together, but also we multiply i with i, which is i squared, which is a minus, and the mixed terms become imaginary. Easy. Modulus, probably the most important thing uh, for us uh, about uh, complex numbers, is let's say the length of, of the vector of uh, imaginary uh, of uh, complex uh, of complex number. And uh, well, you can see that this uh, multiplication of uh, uh, complex number with its conjugation, uh, or if we write it in the, this form, it's just the square root of squares of uh, real part and uh, imaginary part. And in the example, we have some number 2 minus 3i, the real, real part is 2, imaginary part is uh, minus 3. Conjugation changes the sign, so 2 plus 3i. The modulus, well, we can take a square of 2 is 4, square of minus 3 is 9, uh, so the modulus is square root of 13. Okay. Um, that was, let's say, uh, the form in which we look as a, a like on the Euclidean plane, the real part, an imaginary part. Well, each complex number can be represented here. For example, let's say minus, uh, minus 1 and minus i is on the real part, we have minus 1. On the imaginary part, we have also minus 1. So we can spot the, um, the complex number. Um, different representation is to um, somehow um, put it in the polar or well, let's say multiplied form where r is the modulus, so again, uh, length of the vector, and we have, we have an exponent to the i times phi, which is argument or phi, a phase, uh, what we usually call it phase, and it's a totally equivalent representation. Um, so, um, um, if you, you can look that just uh, with cosine and sine, we just can perform a projections on each of the planes and we get a real part and imaginary part. What is really nice about uh, this part uh, representation is that if we have a fixed modulus but the change phases, uh, the complex number just goes around on circles, okay? Uh, on circles. Because, well, this is exactly, well, it, it has a fi the vector has a fixed length but just moves around uh, the uh, complex plane uh, with this fixed length from the origin. Uh, and the multiplication is extremely easy uh, in polar form. If we multiply two uh, numbers, we just multiply the moduli and add uh, bases. Okay, so that's actually all about complex numbers I wanted to say. Uh, I will just wait a second because I see people uh, writing. <laughs> uh, yeah. And the third slide of mathematical introduction. And the third slide of mathematical introduction is well, we can form matrices uh, with uh, complex numbers or fill matrices with uh, uh, complex numbers. And as you will discover in a moment, matrices are extremely important in quantum mechanics. So if we have um, matrix M consisting of well, some numbers, A, B, C, D, in this case they are complex. Well, the basic operation is well, the transposition, so flipping the matrix uh, with regard to its uh, diagonal. Uh, complex conjugation, which is a complex conjugation of all the number, complex numbers in the, well, all the numbers in the matrix. And we have composition of those two things called Hermitian conjugation, which is the most important uh, operation from the uh, quantum mechanical standpoint. And as I said, it's a composition. So basically, we flip the matrix with the transposition and change the uh, and conjugate the complex numbers. Uh, not that hard. Um, of course, we can multiply matrices. Um, there's a specific rule for that. And quite important in quantum mechanics, as almost everything is a phrase in the 
language of uh, matrices, um, the order of uh, operations matter. So if we first multiply uh, one matrix, matrix by the other and then uh, do the uh, different order, they in general do not necessarily, uh, the, the result does not uh, necessarily equal um, uh, each other. Okay, and two very important types of matrices in quantum mechanics are Hermitian matrices, in which uh, the um, application of uh, Hermitian conjugation doesn't change the matrix. It's uh, somehow it's a very similar concept to symmetric matrices because if we flip, uh, we do transposition transposition on symmetric matrices, they do not change. In here, we do transposition and conjugation. Uh, and uh, the extremely useful property is that uh, all eigenvalues of those matrices are real. We'll go back to eigenvalues uh, in the future. Uh, and unitary matrices. Uh, so, for unitary matrices, the complex conjugation, uh, the Hermitian conjugation, actually equals to inverting the matrix. So, it's an extremely easy way to find the inverse matrix uh, for unitary matrices. We just perform a Hermitian conjugation, well, which means that uh, u, which is the unitary matrix, times uh, u dagger equals just 1. Okay? Uh, well, as uh, u and inverse uh, u is 1. It's a generali generalization of uh, orthogonal matrices. Uh, so, orthogonal matrices would have, uh, again, a transposition instead of uh, Hermitian conjugation. And we can look at them, well, the orthogonal matrices can be interpreted as rotations, um, rotation matrices. So, uh, in this case, this is a generalization of rotation. We'll get to that why we look at, uh, well, how can we see uh, those unitary, unitary matrices as rotations. Well, the determinant is, the modulus of the determinant is uh, 1. You have to remember we are in the realm of complex numbers, which means that the well, determinant of this matrix can be any phase um, with a modulus uh, equal to uh, with a modulus equal to 1. This is also important because the determinant of a matrix is somehow connected to the volume, right? Uh, that then is spanned by, uh, by the matrix, so it preserves, let's say, we'll see uh, the volume in the space uh, in which we work. Okay. Mathematical introduction done, but uh, <laughs> maps not done yet. Uh, and uh, right now, I'd like to cover the um, postulates of quantum mechanics. We'll go through not all, but the most important postulates of quantum mechanics, and uh, we'll also try to improve our understanding and set up the stage for any other um, what, what is going to follow. Uh, so the first postulate. Very well, still very mathematical. In quantum mechanics, the language in which we speak uh, is by representing vectors in a Hilbert space. Okay, well, again, mathematical. We'll get into what Hilbert space is. Uh, probably quite important disclaimer in this course, uh, we only consider finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Uh, in general, quantum mechanics uh, can be read well. Uh, some systems can be described with infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, which complicates everything, but it has, I would say, no use in quantum computation. So let's drop infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. And, uh, okay, so I said vectors and Hilbert space. Uh, Hilbert space. So first, let's think about vectors. So uh, you probably all know the vectors as uh, just columns of numbers, and uh, that's a completely correct way to look at uh, vectors. Uh, well, uh, the vectors usually uh, have a, well, they always have, are a column of vectors of numbers, and the, the amount of numbers, or number of numbers, is the dimension of the space in which they live. Okay? And uh, I would like, well, so we know the columns. But uh, in quantum mechanics, because those vectors tend to grow and they, they are quite big, we introduce uh, a specific notation. We uh, call uh, uh, we call vectors heads, not like animals. It's T A T E T, and um, the uh, dual vectors or the transposed conjugated vectors are called graphs. 
well, like a cleavage, but yeah, cross. Let's let's live it let's live it uh, like that. And usually the first, the, well, the location is with this kind of a uh, um, vertical line and this uh, uh, acute bracket. Uh, yeah, and usually um, call them zero one up to some uh, up to d minus one. Uh, and zero corresponds to the first basis vector, uh, the one to the second basis vector, and so on, so on, so on, so on. Okay, and how do we treat the dual vectors? Just a disclaimer. Well, we can look at them as a Hermitian conjugation. Okay, liberal space. <laughs> I told you that there's almost no math. <laughs> no. Uh, so let's not uh, well, think about too much about Hilbert spaces. The most important thing is that we can perform linear combination of, of vectors that we just introduced, so um, weighted sum of, of those vectors. Well, we can phrase any vector on the Hilbert space, let's say psi, as a combination with some coefficients, um, as a combination of base vectors plus uh, times some coefficients. Well, any vector phi, and we have inner product. So, uh, if... Um, Ah, okay, <laughs> fine. Uh, and uh, if we act uh, between base, if we close with an inner product, um, the two base vectors, well, they are, if they are the same vectors, they're one. If they are different vectors, they're zero. So we have this uh, delta here. And why did we call cat and bra? Because if we call close bra and cat, we have a bracket, very smart name, by the way. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's all. And uh, multiplying two vectors together, well, uh, with an inner product, gives you a number, and uh, you can do it by just using the basis representation. In this case, psi is conjugate, so we have a star, uh, so coefficients uh, with a um, complex conjugation, and the uh, uh, bra. And uh, use the basis representation of the other vector, beta, coefficients uh, not, uh, not conjugated, and cat. Okay, those are zero and one, so in the end we just get the uh, multiplication of the coefficients. And we also add, it's not necessary, but for the probability interpolation of quantum mechanics, we uh, usually work in the states which are normalized. So the inner product uh, of a state with itself is one. Uh, an example, any state can be represented as a, a column vector uh, of coefficients alpha, zero, one, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we have, well, I gave you two normalized vectors, uh, phi one and phi two. Um, this is a uh, phi one also in a uh, written in with uh, cats. This is a uh, phi one written with uh, the column approach. A matrix approach and uh, um, the multiplication we can see we just multiply uh, multiply the coefficients so we have coefficient one here at phi one conjugated but it's one again times one plus i one plus i so that's exactly what we have two uh, i times uh, i uh, minus i so two times i minus i is two and so on and so on. That's how you get the uh, your product. Uh, does it? It sometimes freezes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and you can look also at the uh, multiplication as a uh, just uh, matrix multiplication. Okay. So you use the normalization factors and multiply the vectors in a row versus column way. Exercise as you can see. This is uh, probably most computationally intensive uh, um, uh, task for you today. Um, so it just well, it's it's like uh, to multiply four numbers or something. Like this. So hopefully you manage. Uh, can you try to do exercise one?
So the idea is to uh, find the n, which is basically need to see the norm of the uh, of, of the state, and from that infer what what should be n. Uh, so uh, the norm will be in the end after normalization equal to one. Uh, I will just write it here because then I will have to switch to presentation when I don't have such nice uh, Latin uh, formula uh, editing. So just in case you need this in the moment. The idea behind this task is so you can get just comfortable with these kind of things. And you can see there is also a second question, which will be the next exercise. Uh, the question is n that can find all of these three, or maybe they can find other things. If you need, I can also go a uh, slide back if it helps anybody. Just the uh, state is here, and all the calculations are here. Um, and maybe I just write the okay. So, um, 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 Okay, uh, one more minute and we will be Probably. So we'll see. 
22, okay, great. 24, okay, great. I'll go on. Uh, okay, so the answer to the first question, um, A, B, C, or D. I hope you remember it. Sorry, I, I had no, uh, no way to put those numbers onto the quiz, so I had to resort to A, B, C, and D. I think I can also, just for a moment, go. Yeah, so you can see also the answers. And we are going a little bit slow, but that's fine. Okay. I just hope that I didn't make mistakes in this, in, this uh, in all those exercises. Because it would be uh, quite a failure. Okay, I think uh, we are done. Okay, so most of the answers were A, which is, let's see, yeah, the correct answer. Congratulations to all we people who said A. Uh, we have some changes on the leaderboard, uh, awesome. And uh, we have also a question two. I will not give you uh, additional time, just well, please decide between A and B. Is, uh, is N unique? A, yes, uh, uh, B, no. I'll go straight to this uh, question. Okay, you have again a minute uh, to answer, so that's your time for that. Okay, so most of the people decided that it's not unique, and actually this is a correct answer. We have some changes. Yeah, well, uh, so in the first calculation, uh, we saw that actually what we got is the modulus of the n, uh, right? And well, the easiest, uh, the easiest choice for this modulus to be uh, well equal to something is just take it as a real uh, number, so square root of 26. But nothing prohibits us from taking any other number which has a complex number, which has a modulus of square root of 26, but any other phase, okay? So that's exactly uh, what I've written here. And what is quite important in quantum mechanics is that global phase in the state, so in front of the whole state, does not matter at all, okay? It's uh, just uh, redundancy in the mathematical language and it absolutely has no physical meaning. Okay, so let's go further. Um, the most, well, so we were talking about hyperspace and the state. The most important state that you've probably heard a lot about um, since uh, throughout the week is one qubit system. A qubit is mathematically a two uh, state uh, system. Physically, a Greg will, uh, uh, will give you some representation, physical implementations of qubits. And you, it will be quite a treat, I must say, because he prepared the whole presentation as an animated presentation, so I'm sure you will love it. And uh, some um, 
most notable examples of, uh, of a qubit state, this is a general qubit state. There's also normalization uh, condition here. We have to, we want the uh, states to be normalized. And we also, uh, as I said, the phase can be any phase. The global phase can be any phase. So that's another redundancy. Well, so uh, if we take A to 1, beta to 0, we have the first phase state. The inverse is the second phase uh, state. We can combine them, perform an equal composition um, that gives a uh, so called plus state. Uh, the difference is a minus state, and again, sum and the difference, but with i in front of uh, the second state, is i plus and uh, i minus uh, state. And we can see them on the block sphere. So, block sphere is a geometrical representation of uh, a cubic system. Uh, so, we can, because of the normalization and the global phase, which doesn't matter, we can choose to uh, write alpha as a cosine, uh, beta as a sine, so cosine squared plus sine squared is 1, we all know that, so normalization is taken care of. And the global phase, we choose that the phase of alpha is uh, 0, so all the important phase, the relative phase is stored with, with, uh, in the second state. And in such a way we have two parameters, theta and phi, and we can, well, two parameters actually uh, span a two-dimensional surface, and this surface is uh, taken to be a sphere, because of the normalization. And, uh, <coughs> word of caution, the different states of the system are represented on the sphere, uh, but the states which are orthogonal or perpendicular, so for example 0 and 1, are not perpendicular on this picture. You can see that 0 and 1 is on the poles, not on the like uh, perpendicularly uh, as you would expect. Okay? So the state 0 and 1 are the south, uh, north and south poles of the, uh, of the block sphere. The states that I mentioned, a plus state and minus state, are also, let's say, poles, but or um, yeah, poles, but if we look uh, along not z axis but x axis, so it's plus is here, minus is here, and there's i plus and i minus uh, here, uh, along it's uh, there are poles along y axis here and here, and uh, you can see, for example, that all that changes on the equator of the block sphere is just relative phase between the uh, the, uh, the vectors. Uh, the combinations of the vectors, the combination of the, the, the vectors. Okay, so that's a block sphere. It will be useful in a moment when we talk about the evolution of quantum systems. And one qubit is not enough to impress uh, you, surely. So, uh, what we do, we have to compose uh, systems of many qubits. Yesterday we saw uh, 30 qubits. We didn't see it, yeah, we saw the computer at, uh, with 30 qubits. And uh, how do we describe uh, multiple qubit systems? We have a tensor product. So we um, the a tensor product. Well, well, when we compose, let's say, qubits, we perform a tensor product of a Hilbert space of one qubit with a Hilbert space of a second qubit, and so on, and so on, and so on. The dimension multiplies. So uh, the dimension of uh, one qubit is two. The dimension of the well, second qubit is also two. So uh, the Hilbert space of uh, of a two qubit system is four dimensional. Well, not a good example, right? Because if we add them, it would be also a 4, but you get the idea. And customarily, for the states, operating on those uh, Hilbert uh, states composed of different Hilbert spaces, uh, well, composed with a tensor product, we use this kind of notation. The most uh, simple one is just writing uh, the basic states one after another in, the, in one cat. Uh, and uh, well, there's a multiplication rule, and in general, well, if we have uh, one qubit which is zero, well, two, two uh, state of one qubit with two states zero and one, uh, we compose them. Well, the first state in such a composite uh, space is zero zero, as in here, zero one. Well, multiplication zero one, uh, one zero, so one zero, and one one. Okay, so that's uh, how we compose. And probably the most important thing about the composi composition of quantum states is the, the possibility of having an entangled state. 
Okay, you probably heard a lot about the entanglement and um, we use a sample negative definition for an angular space. So if we can write two um, two vectors as a tensor product, they are not entangled, they are product state. But all others are entangled and uh, simple uh, example is the so-called Bell plus state, which is 0, 0 plus 1, 1. You can try, but you will not be able to write it as a product state. And the entangled states have a very interesting property that usually, well, the first numbers in the cat, they, call it, they uh, consider the first qubit, the second numbers in the states consider the second qubit, and what is important in entangled states uh, is that, well, there are some correlations between the states, right? So if you would, for example, create these two qubit states, state, have two particles, move them at the distance and measure one of them, for example, uh, well, we'll talk about the measurement in a moment, and we'll find that it was in a state zero, we immediately know that the other uh, system will also be in the state zero, and other way around. But, well, some people say oh, that we can have a super luminous transfer of information then if we can, um, if we can measure and instantly know something about the other system, uh, not true, really. First, we have to somehow uh, move the uh, two systems away, and more importantly, the moment well, we don't know which one, as you will see in a moment, in the measurement, we don't know which one actually part will measure, if 0, 0 or 1, 1. So it's completely random, so we have no influence on the, um, what, what will actually measure, so we cannot transfer the uh, information. But what is the most important thing? Non-entangled states basically um, evolve without seeing each other, and entangled states feel each other. Okay, so there's a, there's a thing. <laughs> Are you ready for some more uh, exercises? Check it. Try to find which state of uh, is entangled. Okay, that's actually not so easy, so <laughs> good luck. I think that um, there's an extremely uh, complicated formula that can be used by you here. Is a plus b squared is a squared plus a b plus b a plus b squared. Well, you can write two a b, but in quantum mechanics operations, uh, actually order matters. Uh, 
this is the most demanding lecture of the series, don't worry. <laughs> I'll give you one more minute. Get ready. Hopefully. I just hope that we don't hit the 50% limit uh, too uh, soon. Okay, I'll go with the question. Please remember A, B, C, or D, because as I told you, I cannot uh, do that on the quiz, so it will be A versus B versus C versus D. Okay. And this one is actually hard. Okay. You can try to answer. Well, you can answer. Uh, Bohr uh, rule, 
which says that probability that we actually measure the state in this for the for in this eigen vector on, or in this for this eigen value of the Hermitian matrix is exactly equal to the modulus squared of this inner product between the state we have and the uh, the state that we well, would like to observe that is of our interest. And I will give you uh, an example right away, I think. Uh, yeah, so let's look at three very important uh, Hermitian matrices. You can look, uh, you can see that they are Hermitian, right? If they have uh, real numbers on the diagonal and zero everywhere, for sure they are Hermitian. Uh, here also uh, just real numbers and symmetric matrix. So if it's symmetric and real, then it's Hermitian. This one will perform a Hermitian conjugation. You will see that it's Hermitian. And actually, what I used so far, the basis I used so far, if we act with Hermitian matrix on the state 0 and 1, you can, find, uh, you can see that they are actually the eigenstates of the matrix Z. Okay? Because uh, the matrix Z does not change the state 0, it just gives a number, which is exactly what uh, happens if uh, matrix acts on an eigenvector. Z uh, acting on 1, the other basis state, gives the same state, but with a different eigenvalue. Um, when we act with any other of those matrices on the, uh, those states 0 and 1, which is also called a computational basis, they change the state. But actually, the uh, state that I showed you, the plus state and I plus state, minus and I minus states, are the alien basis of the X and Y, okay? And uh, X, Y, Z is not a coincidence, you'll see that in a moment on the block sphere. Okay, so that's the thing, but I think we can actually, uh, well, it can be somehow a little bit complicated. So uh, I heard that using props during the talks is always a good thing. So actually I um, propose uh, that I will perform an experiment. I'm a physicist, so uh, in Poland they will always say there's not enough experiments on physics classes, so I'll perform one. Uh, there's something called polar uh, polarization filter, which basically uh, what it does when a light hits a polarization filter, well, it becomes polarized. We can, uh, the unpolarized uh, light, which is, for example, uh, the sunlight, um, is unpolarized, which means that the electric field uh, of light uh, just wobbles in, on one plane, and this is exactly the polarization plane, and, uh, well, and you can change in which plane it wobbles, and then it will change the polarization. And uh, actually, I have with me some polarization filters. And well, this is a polarization filter. Um, and to check if it actually uh, polarizes anything, the best way to check it is to use the second one, polarization filter, and just look how they interact. If they both point in the same direction, which is not the case, rewind. There's actually, we can see through the both of the glasses, right? But if we start to rotate one with respect to the other, the, um, the, well, the glasses start to get dark, right? So they do not uh, um, get any light through, right? So that's actually what happened right now, and it's, uh, it's the setup when one polarization, polarization filter passes uh, allows the light to pass with vertical polarization and the second allows to pass with the uh, horizontal polarization so they basically block each other, right? Yeah, we can revert that by uh, rotating the filters. Now they point in the same, uh, for the same polarization. So it's a little bit dimmer, but well, it's obvious that it's not a perfect uh, device and also the first one blocks all the light from which is horizontally polarized. And, well, actually, we can use a mathematical uh, language of quantum mechanics to uh, represent this situation. We can introduce two, two states of light, the vertically polarized and horizontally polarized, okay? And we can use the language of measurement to see if the light will get through or not. 
And uh, what do we do? Well, we uh, say that the intensity of light will be proportional to the, well, Born rule in this case of the modulus squared of the uh, inner product of the state of light, some state of light, and uh, the uh, setup of our polarization filter. And we can uh, actually um, represent the state of the polarization filter, well, as rotated in any direction with one uh, parameter theta. Okay, so it's again just projection. Uh, theta vertical uh, times ver uh, cos cosine theta vertical sine theta horizontal. Okay, so that's how we can somehow decompose uh, the any polarization uh, vector. Yeah, and that's what I said is well when we uh, perform the uh, when we uh, set the filters in such a way that one uh, lets through the vertical polarization, the other lets through the horizontal polarization, well, we can see that those are two basis states, orthogonal basis states, so they give you a zero probability of going through, and that's more or less what we see. If, we, if I would uh, revert that to V times V, well, this would be V acting on V, so uh, we will have a probability that it will uh, non-zero one that will go through minus the uh, problems with the, um, the the first light is unpolarized. Okay, and now the most important question: What happens if we have two polarization filters blocked and we add the third filter in front of them? Anybody has any idea? Well, nothing will happen because those two filters block the light uh, with respect to each other, right? If we put it behind, absolutely nothing happens. <coughs> but what is interesting, if you put them uh, between those two blocked filters, you probably can see that actually the light passes, right? So that's quite an intriguing effect, which can also be <laughs> a little bit uh, well, let's draw a parallel that uh, actually the order of the uh, things we do in quantum mechanics matter, right? And well, so we get this kind of result that, well, uh, the, in the point that I put the third polarization filter between, the light passes through. And well, you can see that it's tilted. What happens if I um, start to rotate it? Well, it actually gets like, again dark. Some light, can you see it, right? You can see it, okay. And dark again. So it seems like 45 degrees is a very special angle that uh, lets, the, uh, lets the light uh, go through. And well, we have language of quantum mechanics to explain that uh, thing, okay? So, uh, we know that after the unpolarized uh, light from the sun passed through the first polarization filter, it got uh, polarized in the, let's say, vertical direction. What we do with a rotated uh, second filter is we, well, we uh, project it onto a different plane, a tilted plane, and well, well, we can, for example, uh, find a new basis. The first basis that we used was vertical times horizontal, V times horizontal, but let's introduce for the second filter another basis. The two base vectors will be, again, perpendicular, but they will be tilted with respect to the, uh, so it will be, let's say, 45 degrees and minus 45 degrees. We can find such basis and see how the vertical uh, vector, the vertical light that we have here, uh, projects onto the onto the uh, this tilted basis. And well, it seems that 45 degrees has some uh, part which is vertical, right? So if we um, if we project, so if we uh, measure the state with the second uh, feature we get non-zero uh, probability that it will go through, okay? And, well, okay, so now it's in the state, uh, in the tilted state, okay? And it both have a, a vertical part, a horizontal part, 
well, it collapsed to the vertical and the horizontal part. So we can then see, okay, so vertical line, uh, the tilted line, how it does, uh, how is it is measured in the horizontal places. Well, so we can see that it has a part of a, uh, it has a horizontal part. So actually, that's again, we have non zero probability of letting the light. So it seems that each measurement that we perform or each action of the polarizer collapse the state which was, for example, unpolarized first to some specific state that we enforce it to be, in this case vertical, then we enforce it to be in a, til in a tilted state, 45 degrees, and then enforce it to be the horizontal, and that was the way actually to transport it through three filters. So that's exactly what I uh, wished to <laughs> show you, and hopefully you will remember this strange behavior and that it, it can also be explained with classical physics, uh, classical uh, electrodynamics, uh, but it's much harder uh, explanation than that. Actually, this one is much better suited, I believe. Okay, so that was about the measurement. Uh, the first and last postulate, and will not, uh, again, this is the typical uh, how it's stated, that the dynamics in quantum system is governed by some differential equation, uh, which is, uh, in fact, um, the generator of the evolution is some H operator, which is called Hamiltonian, and this is an uh, energy operator of the system. Doesn't matter that much for us. The more important thing is that um, if we want to change a state, not in a measurement way, but just evolve the state, uh, we'll do it with unitary matrix. Okay? So unitary matrices, we already covered Hermitian matrices, now unitary matrices change the state. Okay, we have some time. Yeah. Okay, uh, and another uh, problem for you, just NAB, you can try to, you can try to, so we have a unitary matrix, so we will perform some evolution of the system, or maybe some computation, right? And the question is, if we act with U such that the action on an arbitrary state, which is prepared as a tensor product of some state, and let's say zero state, the, we, we don't care what's on in the, in the second qubit, that it will be able to uh, move this state phi, well, leave it alone in the first qubit, and move it to the second qubit, okay? Let's assume there's this kind of evolution uh, of the quantum system, the unitary UCL that moves it. And the question is, what is the result of the action on the, well, a very similar state, right? The general state on the, of the first qubit and then zero, as, as above. And uh, I, would, yeah, yeah, I would give you one or two minutes. It's, uh, well, you can also do this. Trust me. <laughs> I'll give you, yeah, I think two minutes is fine. May I? Let's look on the phones, at the phones. And I'll start the, um, the countdown. Okay, uh, in a minute, let's wait for the players. Um, okay, so A or B, some spoiler here. And one minute answer. Okay, 
30 seconds more. Okay. Almost there. Okay, and I'll actually tell you the answer. The only true answer for this question is that uh, I'm a naughty boy. And actually, both answers seem to be correct, okay? And this is quite strange. Uh, and well, actually, we had 50-50. That's also actually good, good for you. <laughs> okay, that's better than I thought. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, actually what you did is you, is you just proved uh, the easy version of the node loading theorem of quantum computation. And um, if, if you look at, uh, if you do it in two different ways, you assume there's such a unitary that copies the state from one qubit to another qubit, or sometimes we call it from one qubit register to another qubit register. If you first uh, well, we have exactly here what, what was the task, right? Apply unitary to this state, right? Which uh, the, the unitary copies everything to the second register. So if we first uh, use the copying uh, mechanism, right? This thing will be, will, will be copied to the second register. So we have two uh, copies of the general state. And we can write it down and get the first answer. Uh, if we do it in a different order, so first uh, copy, uh, sorry, first uh, multiply the state inside the uh, bracket, so we get alpha 0, 0, beta 0, 1, and then copy, we'll get a different answer. And actually, well, we reducted this assumption of such unitary to an absurd. We get two different answers, and we asked for uh, well, which can be satisfied for alpha and beta zero, but not that it for arbitrary style. So, well, that's actually what we've pro proven, that no such unitary exists. And it's a huge, actually, thing in quantum computing, and a huge no-go, uh, let's say, thing that we have to go around, that we basically do not have this equals uh, operator as in uh, programming. That if we have some unknown variable, we cannot copy it uh, further, propagate it, well, copy it to another register, to another memory cell, let's say. Okay, so that's, uh, well, we saw some paradoxes, and this is one of them, actually. <coughs> but, um, no such unitary exists. So, uh, points for, particip point, point for participation in the, <laughs> in the exercise for you. Okay, yeah. So, let's now uh, move a little bit to quantum computation. Because that's exactly what we will do. Evolving the state is the most important thing about the computation uh, on, uh, performed on, uh, uh, on quantum computers. And uh, as I told you, uh, the evolution will be uh, application of some unitary matrices. And actually, uh, we do not, uh, in quantum computation, we don't care that much about time. We just say, well, time is discretized. One application of, uh, of some uh, unitary matrix or gate is a one, one time step, okay? So let's see what kind of uh, operations we can apply to. And probably the, um, easiest, uh, the easiest gate we can perform, or easiest uh, matrix we can perform, is just an identity matrix, which when we uh, look at it from the point of view of a basis state, if it acts on the state zero, it transforms it to state zero. So it doesn't transform it. As we, uh, if we look at the, if we act uh, with identity matrix on state one, it also doesn't change it. And actually, we have a nice language with cats and grass uh, to represent matrices. That this is the state we take in, and this is a uh, j is the state that we goes out. So the Oh, sorry, that's uh, supposed to be I, sorry, not X, that's first mistake I spotted uh, after many proofreadings. Uh, so, um, that's, in here we have exactly what I've said before, we take a state 0 
and as an output we create a state 0, we take a state 1, and as, a, as an output we uh, get the state 1. That's how we uh, can represent the identity uh, matrix or on the identity gate. We have the x, actual get x gate, that, uh, <laughs> that was a mistake. So uh, the x gate is a not gate, so it inverts the states. 0 goes to 1, the basis states. 0 goes to 1, 1 goes to 0. So we, we represent it in the same way that we talked before. 0 goes in, 1 goes out. 1 goes in, 0 goes out. And actually, as a matrix, it's an X matrix that we've seen before. Um, oh, maybe I'll do it on time. Uh, extremely important gate, uh, not that easy. Uh, well, it is still. Is that it gets the, uh, when it acts on the basis uh, state 0, the computational basis, it moves it to state class. If you remember, there was a, a class state. Um, that's an equal superposition of state 0 and 1. And if it works, uh, if it acts on the state 1, it moves it to state minus, uh, that you may also remember, uh, which is, uh, again, equal superposition, but with an opposite phase or opposite, uh, opposite sign. And, well, we can well, right now it's not that easy to see, right? But if it takes state 0, it gives out the equal superposition. If it uh, one acts on the state 1, it gives an equal superposition with minus 1. If you multiply it, well, let's, uh, let's see, actually. Uh, it's uh, 0 and 0. Let's identify this element, 0 and 0. So it, it will be 0 and 0. Um, yeah, does it work? It should. Uh, 0 and 0 is here, so 1 over one uh, squared of 2. And do we have any other 0? No, so it will be actually 1. Yeah, well, you can do it, surely. And uh, what is also intriguing, important, is that, well, it's Hermitian and Unitary, that's something to remember for the future. And uh, I told you that the 0 and 1 they are the eigenstates of the Z matrix, of the Hermitian Z matrix, while uh, X uh, has an um, eigenstate of plus and minus 1. So Hadamard gate can be seen as in changing the basis in which we measure. Okay? We are not measuring um, Z or O, that's a little bit too far for now, uh, or uh, along the X axis, but well, with Hadamard we change how we uh, with respect to which axis we can measure the state. And probably the most useful thing about the Hadamard is when we have multiple qubits, and we, uh, well, when we perform Hadamard on each of the qubits, it actually, this uh, behavior propagates, uh, and uh, it also creates an equal superposition of states. So basically, if we have a state, multi-qubit state in zero uh, state, apply Hadamard gates, it will, like, from one state, open to superposition of all the possible states on the uh, Hilbert space, which is, well, extremely uh, useful, as uh, you'll probably uh, find in uh, Greg's uh, lecture. Okay. Ah, exercise. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have this kind of uh, logic table. Can you try uh, to construct the matrix? following exactly the same procedure that I've, um, I've uh, described. This one, I hope, is uh, slightly easier than the ones before. Yeah, we'll be on time.
and as you can see, it's called fail state because well, it doesn't change the first state, the zero zero state, but it adds phase to the whole state by changing the state, the phase of the second uh, basis vector. So relative uh, phase changes after application of this gate. Ready? Uh, is everybody ready for answering? Please remember ABCD. I will also uh, present it uh, after I start the question. Uh, okay, we will go. Oh, okay, some more. We'll go. Down. Okay, so correct answer gives max points. We will start in a moment. Yeah, so 60 seconds as usual, uh, four answers, A, B, C, or D. You have the, uh, you have the, the display on the screen, screens. Yes, exactly. It's a B uh, gate. Uh, well, the mm, B answer the gate. As I told you, well, it doesn't change the state from zero to one, uh, from one to zero. So uh, the non-diagonal terms should be zero, right? It doesn't change uh, state zero. Uh, well, in any way, even with the phase or anything, the state zero. So it should act trivially on the first state. And it adds this phase only to the uh, second state, which is uh, seen uh, uh, in this uh, in this matrix entry. Very good. Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, I think this is the last part of one cubic gates. Uh, well, actually, what we can do with the gates that I presented before, so X, Y, Z, Hadamard, and so on. Well, we can. Well, we say we exponentiate them. Well, so uh, we don't want to get into details, but the Hermitian matrix, Hermitian operator, can be a gen uh, generator of a unitary um, transformation. And what we can well get from exponentiating gates is the rotations on the qubit with arbitrary uh, with arbitrary um, uh, angle. And the well, demonstration of that is can be seen with RZ um, uh, gate that takes the vector from the zero state and rotates it by some angle that we define around x axis. Okay, so now we also probably connect some dots and see that well, ah, that's why we call it x, right? Okay, so that's exactly the demonstration of what R, uh, RZ, uh, Rx uh, gate does, the zero state. Well, you, you, you probably expected that uh, Ry uh, performs the rotation with some arbitrary angle uh, along, uh, along uh, y axis of the block sphere. And, well, okay, so we have this inter interpretation of rotations. Well, can we actually look how the uh, generators or 
or the case that we discussed before uh, out on the, on the block screen. And they actually do rotations, but not with respect to arbitrary angle. But X performs a, well, all, a half full rotation between, um, between along the X axis. So it, well, it was a not great also, right? So it changes zero state to one state. Uh, y does the same, but in a different, on a different path, again, along Y axis. Actually, after application of Y, you'll get uh, a phase I uh, in the, uh, as an action, but it's a global phase, it will not change anything. So, uh, and Z, well, uh, rotating around, along the Z axis, well, of the, uh, of the vector that is on the Z axis doesn't do anything. Right, so uh, that's also how we see that this is uh, the, z the state zero and one. By the way, uh, is an eigenstate of a z matrix. Right, it didn't uh, change the state. It just well uh, pr produces uh, uh, some factor in front of it. So, um, well, this is a geometrical interpretation of uh, the eigen uh, eigenstates of uh, different operators. But in fact, we can rotate with z axis. But what we have to do is first to apply Hadamard gate. I told you that Hadamard gate changes the uh, the basis in which we work. And actually, that also I also told you that it sends the uh, zero state into the plus state, which was located exactly in here. And the interpretation maybe not that easy in this moment is that it uh, wrote the Hadamard gate. Uh, rotates along this kind of a tilted at 45 degrees axis uh, of the whole block sphere. And well, after we, after we apply the Hadamard gate, which does this slightly different rotation, we can perform Z and rotate the state around the equator of the sphere. Okay, so we can actually do quite a lot different, well, we can reach any state on a invert space with those gates, and actually it's already redundant, even with. Uh, Parts of those gates we could uh, reach any any state. Well, well, well this parameterized. Okay, so that well, that, that was acting on one QB, but to perform any useful computation, we actually have to uh, act with two qubit gates. So act on two registers, and you've seen before that I've re uh, shown the representation of gates on well, as you learn, circuits. So the line, horizontal lines actually distinguish different qubits or different qubits registers. And one qubit well is the one line, the second qubit is the line below. And in a uh, case of a uh, two qubit gate that I'd like to present to you uh, three minutes, four minutes more, uh, <coughs> is the control node uh, gate, which uh, distinguishes two qubit registers, a control register and the target register. And if the control uh, register is in a state zero, it doesn't change anything in the whole system. The, whole system. the target uh, register is unaltered. So uh, from state zero, zero, you'll get zero, zero. Zero, one, you'll get zero, one. But if control qubit is on, it's in state one, it will invert the uh, second uh, qubit register. So from one, one, zero, you'll get one, so we invert, so one, one. And from one, one, you'll get one, zero. Uh, that's, uh, well, very classical inter interpretation, right? Classical, I mean, opposed to, qua uh, to quantum. Well, those kind of things we can perform on uh, classical computers perfectly fine, and it's uh, not, not that impressive, okay? Um, but what was the strength of quantum computation if this thing works? Yes? Um, then what we can apply it to not only to basis vectors, but to arbitrary states, okay? And actually, what's really nice about uh, C naught or control naught gate is that if we apply it to arbitrary state, it just doubles the basis states of the uh, of, of our arbitrary state. It's not cloning the state because we are not cloning the arbitrary state to arbitrary state, but we are actually well expanding well, expanding. That's also not the best word, but we are make well. We are embedding this 
one step into higher dimensional uh, space in such a way that well, you can see that it, uh, it embeds very well. So it uh, goes to from zero with alpha zero to alpha zero zero, beta one to beta one one. And for example, with such a gate, if the uh, state you start with is uh, a plus state, so for example, you applied first Hadamard and then apply a, a, a Synod gate, you will get a Bell plus state that I mentioned to you before, which is an entangled state. And in general, you can expect that if you have a two qubit gates, the state that you uh, obtain at the end of the computation is entangled. Actually, the opposite of uh, say is true, that if you do not see two qubit gates, the state will not be entangled, but if you see two, two or multiple qubit gates in a system, there's a good chance that the, star, uh, the uh, output state will be entangled. And which is also really nice, if you apply multiple uh, CNOT gates, like uh, with respect to control re register and some additional registers, uh, with uh, this pairwise application, you even go you can go even further and uh, transform this state alpha zero beta one to alpha zero 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 plus beta one 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 one. Extremely useful for error correction that Greg will mention in a moment. And the second, I will not present to every gate that uh, is there uh, a control Z gate. And the Z actually just changed the phase in the computational basis, right? Change, it didn't change the state. And that's exactly what happens. If a control is off, if it's zero, nothing happens to target. If a uh, control is one, then uh, to the target we apply control Z, uh, to the target we apply Z and uh, Z gate. And you can see that uh, on the diagram it's written in such a way that it's really hard to distinguish uh, control from the target. Well, because actually it's a symmetric gate. It's not that easy to see, just from, from that level well, we can <laughs> call exercise maybe. <laughs> but uh, that's also, well, maybe you can see that, well, you have to really look at the two qubit gates, not in a classical way. I, sh uh, I showed the logic table how it uh, acts on the basis uh, states, but actually, well, it acts on the whole state. and. Uh, from that model, you can see as a tensor product that this particular gate is uh, symmetric. Yeah, okay, so that's all. And this is the basically end, but I would like you to try to uh, solve last final uh, exercise before actually getting your hopefully second copy today, because the first, the first one probably was needed uh, before my lecture. Yeah, so. Uh, that might be a little bit hard. Oh, let's see, it's harder. All the things I mentioned uh, is uh, you have all the means to solve it. So we have a following circuit. So we apply to both of quantum registers other updates, then control Z, and then uh, C not, but C is here and not is here. Okay? And I'll give you like a minute, maybe. Okay, well, I don't want to, you know, uh, <laughs> prohibit you from drinking coffee on time. So I think it's the best to go just by example, from example to example, and try to try to well, work it out. Maybe starting with the last one is the easiest. And then. This would be actually the awesome way to finish the lecture because Greg will pick up with quantum circuits, so hopefully it will be quite coherent. Uh, I will prepare the, uh, the quiz.
you can um, log in, right? Please don't log in, that's all good. And like in 30 seconds, I will uh, start the uh, answer part of the quiz. Okay, so we can uh, start giving answers. Uh, I don't think I have to look at it. I will uh, this, uh, this on the screen. I hope I didn't make a mistake. We started like mm, 10 minutes late and we'll uh, start the break 10 minutes late, so well, don't blame me. Okay, I think we need uh, a couple of seconds, like yeah, 8 seconds. Um, just Last minute decision, last second decision actually. Um, see, I just hope that I didn't make a mistake, sorry. Yeah, okay, maybe uh, <laughs> answer is not very uh, thorough here, but um, the first, well, three is of you, well, almost obviously not equivalent uh, because we have no entanglement introduced, we only one to be case, so. Three, absolutely not. Uh, two, well, I told you that uh, Hadamard gate is Hermitian and unitary, which means that from Hermitian it means that this thing uh, happens, and also from unitary we know that that thing happens. Okay, so that means that application of Hadamard gate on Hadamard gate gives you identity. So those two gates, those two gates are just identity. Okay? So and then if you look, it's the same, exactly the same circuit. Uh, the, this thing here is much harder actually, and uh, if you answer uh, B, well still quite good, quite a good job, I must say. Uh, Big explanation would be to actually perform uh, matrix multiplications, uh, which is uh, not the thing we would like to do. But uh, the other, well, the, 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 let's say basic part here is that um, you can write, uh, I just have to make it, uh, um, yeah, I think it makes sense. Uh, yeah, oh, you will not see that, so actually this is equal to control Z and you can see that that uh, in the way that as I showed it on the one slide before this is X and H X H is equal to Z and this is Z, okay? That was completely not obvious and well, well one uh, hard question uh, I think I had a freedom to ask actually one hard question. And uh, also then you have to use that, you have additional H, but you set this H so they do uh, become identity. So uh, that's all for now. Okay. Hello. Uh, yes, so I will continue uh, with quantum computing. Uh, I think uh, there's uh, some introduction to quantum mechanics uh, and now we will dive into some quantum computation and some uh, simple algorithms. <laughs> so, if somebody wants to 
maybe now join the quiz. I uh, leave this code for a moment. Uh, join. Um, okay. Uh, so let's. So there are many, many um, quantum computing, computing models and basically the two most important ones are gauge-based model and quantum annealing. Uh, today we will focus on quantum-based, uh, on, on gauge-based model. So uh, you uh, saw this notation in the previous talk. Uh, in gauge-based model we uh, have some register of qubits. Usually initialized in state 0, 0, 0, 0, something. Uh, and then we apply operations in terms of quantum gates, this unitary operations represented by unitary matrices, which we have to show. And uh, at the end of this uh, uh, process, we make measurements. So we measure each qubit. Uh, and we repeat this uh, procedure many, many times. So we uh, restart everything, uh, prepare a register once again, apply the same unitary, and repeat the measurements many, many times to obtain some statistics. Because um, with one measurement, usually we cannot. Uh, distinguish the uh, quantum states. So we need to obtain many measurements to find um, probabilities associated with different outcomes, with, with different uh, basis states of these registers. So this is the general idea of gate-based model. Uh, and just to, to mention another one, uh, quantum annealing um, it's a completely different idea because um, in quantum annealing we use the fact that some optimization problems can be um, transferred on some Hamiltonian. What is Hamiltonian? Um, Arthur mentioned it, but uh, Hamiltonian is quantum operator associated with energy of system. So let's imagine that Hamiltonian describes the uh, energy of some quantum system. So uh, we can have different energies of system uh, associated with different configurations of the system. We can plot this, of course, usually in some high dimensional complicated landscape of energy. Uh, but the point is that uh, you can reformulate some optimization problems um, in terms of looking for minima of some Hamiltonian. Um, and quantum annealing uh, uses this, uh, um, uh, this idea. First, we need to write our problem as some Hamiltonian. Then, we start with some simple known Hamiltonian, which uh, has known minimum, some simple known minimum. Uh, and then, we can slowly change a uh, non Hamiltonian into this Hamiltonian which represents our problem. And uh, when we do these uh, changes uh, slowly, we can easier find this new uh, minimum because it continuously uh, can be obtained from the uh, started, starting minimum. And when we find this minimum, uh, this minimum corresponds to solution of our problem. So this is, generally speaking, the idea of quantum annealing. So it is uh, quite different. But uh, today we focus on 
gate based quantum computing. Mm, so first uh, let me show some uh, mm, uh, hardware that allow us to implement uh, qubits. So, ah, so uh, the uh, the good uh, quantum hardware should uh, fulfill some criteria. Uh, first of all, it should be scalable physical system. So uh, it has to be possible to uh, add more, more, uh, add more qubits. Uh, and these qubits um, have to be well characterized because sometimes you can some system which is uh, usually you you have some system that is only um, approximate qubit, not exact qubit. So it is good to, to, to have systems that are as close to real qubits are possible, uh, as possible. Uh, second one, criterion, is the uh, ability to initialize the state of the qubits. Yeah? So we need to start our algorithm with some known state. So we need, we need to know how to uh, put our register in known state. Uh, long coherence type. Uh, because quantum effects are quite fragile, so uh, these qubits don't live too long. Yeah? So uh, because of because of interaction with environment, uh, qubits generally quantum systems uh, uh, lose their quantum nature and become become more and more classical. So uh, we need to have enough long uh, living time of these qubits to uh, have ability to apply all uh, operations before these uh, qubits disappear in the sense that disappear its, its uh, quantum nature. Another uh, uh, criterion is universal set of quantum gates. Uh, Arthur said about one qubit gates and two qubit gates. And it can be shown that uh, using one qubit gates and two qubit gates, you can combine them, you can obtain arbitrary unitary operation uh, on n qubits. Yeah? So uh, you can always decompose uh, some big unitary operation into one and two qubit gates. Uh, so uh, usually, usually uh, on the hardware level, you have implemented only some set of uh, native gates and all other gates are composed of these native gates. Measurement. Yeah. At, the, at the end of the circuit, we need to have capability to uh, measure the system. Uh, and there are also two more criteria which are not very important to us because these criteria are important um, to quantum communication, so ability to, to uh, change between stationary qubit and flying qubits. Yeah, so uh, if you want to send some quantum information, we need to have some possibility to, to change this, uh, let's say, uh, have this qubit into some qubit which, which, which we want to send somewhere. And the second one, the uh, ability to transmit this qubits. So this is not important very uh, for computations, but it is important in general, uh, in general quantum networks. Yeah. And now, uh, what are uh, today's technologies to implement quantum uh, computing systems? Uh, First one is uh, trapped ions. Uh, so these are just ions which are trapped uh, in some uh, electromagnetic potential. And we will discuss it uh, further. Uh, another uh, technologies are superconducting uh, qubits, which are uh, implemented as some Mm, superconducting uh, electrical circuits. There are also neutral atoms, qubits. Uh, these are similar to trapped ions, but uh, 
here are ions and here are atoms, not ions, and because uh, ions can be trapped in electromagnetic potential, but neutral atoms, of course, uh, are not possible to trap in electromagnetic potential, then uh, this kind of rubies are trapped in optical lattices. Yeah, so you, you can, uh, you can uh, put atom in some specific place uh, using uh, lasers. Uh, and another one, photonic quantum computers. So you also can implement uh, qubits using um, photons and some gates that are implemented as some uh, optical devices which uh, act on these photons. And also there are some other new uh, technologies. Uh, we will focus on trapped ions because it is quite uh, didactic case to, 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 to show how it works. Mm. So first of all, uh, we need to uh, tell something about uh, atom in, in, in quantum mechanics. Uh, I call it hydrogen atom. It is nothing to do with hydrogen, but um, Hydrogen atom is basically the only atom in physics that is uh, solvable. Uh, another atoms are just approximations. So let's focus on hydrogen. Uh, we have nucleus. Um, we have electron uh, around. Of course, electron is not a point, but it is rather a wave. Or even better, it is uh, the cloud of probability of finding electrons around. Uh, or you can not find electrons also. Uh. Okay. Uh, here should be cloud, but there is no cloud. Uh, Okay, so even even the electron is not a point particle, it is kind of cloud of probability. You can think about electron as a particle on some discrete um, orbitals, because these different orbitals correspond to different uh, energy. So uh, even that in quantum uh, picture, uh, there are no some specific uh, orbitals, then still the energy is quantized. So uh, you, can, you can think about electron as uh, something that is on some discrete uh, ladder of uh, energies. And uh, very often these trap ions are prepared using uh, calcium uh, 40 ion. And this is the energy structure, structure of outer shell of uh, calcium ions. So uh, these are different possible energies that electron can have. Uh, so we can have electron somewhere, and then this electron can move to uh, some other mm, uh, energy levels. But not all transitions are allowed. Yeah, so uh, electron can hop from here to here, but uh, it cannot hop from here to here, for example. Mm. And to implement our qubit, we need to choose some uh, two basis states, because qubit is two basis uh, state. So uh, in this case, we choose this energy state as our zero state of qubit, uh, and this state as our uh, one state. Uh, why? Because uh, this state is basically infinitely long living, because this is the um, lower state, so it, it, uh, it is basically an infinitely long uh, state. And this state is also quite low. This uh, electron in this state can live uh, around uh, one second. 
So it is quite long for uh, quantum computations. Uh, so we choose these two states as our basis states. Okay, and now we want to uh, implement uh, quantum gates. Uh, first, we want to implement single qubit gates. Uh, so we want to somehow um, induce uh, the transition between these two basis states of electrons. E, and, it can, and it can be done with light. So um, between these two states, there is some energy difference. Uh, and in physics, basically, energy is the same as length, the same as time, the same as mass, and the same as <laughs> because Because the uh, energy of photon is a uh, Planck uh, constant times frequency, and uh, speed of light is a uh, length of uh, wave times frequency. Yeah, so basically energy is the same as length up to constant. Constant doesn't matter. So, uh, so usually uh, this is difference in energies, but it is usually uh, write down as difference in length, but this is not the length of this, I don't know what it does, but this is length of light that uh, should be applied to induce transition between these two uh, levels. And applying this, this light, we can uh, perform so-called Rabi oscillations. These are oscillations between these two states. And then tuning the uh, intensity of light, uh, time of this uh, pulse, and so on and so on, we can intro introduce uh, some specific state. Yeah? So we can obtain some 0 plus 1 state, or 0 minus 1 state, or some state uh, that I have shown before. So this is one qubit gate. Now we also need to um, can perform measurement. Uh, and how to do this? We choose some auxiliary uh, energy level. This energy level has this kind of energy um, gap between the ground level. And important is that there is possible transition of electron between this state and this state, but there is no possibility of transition between this state and this state. So, uh, when we apply uh, light and electron was in this state 1, then it uh, moved to this uh, higher level, but this level is very, very short uh, leading. Yeah? Uh, I, I said before that this state has uh, the coherence time of an order of a second, and this is um, much, 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 much smaller. So, if we, uh, if we uh, uh, shine light on this state, then it is popping uh, here, and very quick, quickly it uh, collapses again on the ground level and emit quantum, uh, yeah, because when, uh, when so applying light we uh, uh, make this uh, move to the higher uh, level and then it spontaneously uh, decaying and emitting a uh, photon. So we can detect this photon. And then we know that our uh, qubit was in state 1. And if our qubit is in state 0, then, even if we apply some light, then it doesn't uh, move here because there is no transition between these energy levels. So, in this case, there is no uh, emitted photon, and uh, detecting these photons, you can uh, distinguish between uh, state 1 and state 0. Okay, but it was just single uh, ion, 
Uh, we know how to perform single qubit plates, uh, how to perform measurement, but we also need uh, two qubit gates to introduce some uh, entanglement between qubits. So uh, we have few atoms, let's say up to 40, something like that, atoms uh, trapped in uh, uh, and there is some um, behavior of this uh, ion chain as a whole chain. Yeah? So uh, we have, to, in each ion, we have this degree of freedom of electron on different uh, energy levels. And also, ion as a whole ion has some energy states in this whole chain. It, in real, the ions uh, not oscillate in this way, but in this way. But it is better animated. Uh, so, uh, and then we can apply uh, two lasers on some <coughs> ions and of course, uh, tuning intensity, phase, something, something. We can introduce uh, some correlation, so we can apply two qubit gate on some uh, two ions. And the uh, trapped ions are uh, quite um, good uh, for applying two qubit gate because you can apply this two qubit gate basically between uh, any pair of uh, ions, yeah, because in superconducting qubits, for example, uh, you have some connectivity between qubits. You cannot apply two qubit gate between any pair of qubits. Here, you, if you can uh, target uh, with laser some complete ion, then you can apply gate. So it is uh, easier to apply uh, gate between even uh, ions which are far away. Okay, so uh, we have some somehow um, real, realized qubits using hardware. Never mind ions or another hardware. hardware. And now uh, we um, can look for some algorithms. So uh, first, uh, it is kind of. Uh, the same thing that Arthur showed, so just to um, uh, repeat this. Uh, we start with register 0, 0, 0, 0. Then we apply some gates. For example, we apply gate X here, and then we uh, obtain one here. Okay? Then we ap apply another X and obtain one here. Then we apply Hadamard gate, and as you know, Hadamard gate introduce a uh, superposition. So this first qubit uh, is now uh, decomposed into superposition of 0 and 1. Then we can apply some two qubit gates, for example, control mode gate, which change uh, this, which change okay, Hadamard, and now control mode change uh, this, this. Oh. Uh, change this qubit because here was 1, so this 0 is changed to 1, but here was 0, so this 0 is still 0. Uh, and at the end, we perform some measurement. And in this case, we at the end have one half probability to obtain result 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, this result, and also one half probability of obtaining result 1110. Yeah, because the uh, probability of obtaining some result is a uh, square modulus of uh, amplitude. So 1 over square root of 2 to the power of 2 is 1 half. So if we do this only once, then we obtain this result or this result, result. We don't know which, 
But if we repeat this process many, many times, we should obtain more or less half uh, times uh, this result and we fall. Probability one half is another result. And exercise now. So we have some simple qubit, uh, circuit with two qubits. And the question is, what is the probability of obtaining basic states at the end of the circuit? So we have two qubits. So at the end, we have four possibilities. 0, 0, or 0, 1, or 1, 0, or 1, 1. And on this histogram, we plot what is the probability of obtaining result 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on. So the question is, what is the probability of obtaining this basic state at the end of this series? So we can try it. Okay, so, um, so let me start this question. this question.
And we have this else. Uh, yeah, the correct answer is 1, not C. Why not C? Uh, we start with space 0, 0. So after applying Hadamard, we obtain 1 over square root of 2 times 0, 0 plus 1. 0, yes, because this is from Hadamat, here is 0, and then applying control node, here nothing changes because it is 0, and here, because this is 1, we change this 0 to 1. So we have superposition of 0, 0, 1, 1, and probability is uh, absolute value squared of this amplitude, so we have probability of one half finding this state and one half finding this state. Okay. And this is maximally a state. Yeah? You can you cannot decompose this into product of states. The C state can be decomposed yeah? because it is zero zero plus one zero, so you can decompose this into zero plus one times zero. So it is uh, separate the state. Uh, okay. But this was um, the result of an uh, ideal uh, quantum operation. In real life you have some noises and basically you can have three types of noises. Uh, the coherence uh, errors and measurement errors. So as I said before, the coherence is uh, the effect of losing quantumness of, of, of state. So we have, for example, our ion or whatever. Uh, but unfortunately, we have not only ion in the universe, but there is also some environment. Uh, and you cannot uh, perfectly separate our ion from environment, so there is some um, interaction between ions and environment, and this interaction uh, leads to changing pure state into mixed state. So, uh, here uh, is one new thing, mixed, mixed states. Yeah? Arthur said that states are some uh, vectors in Hilbert space, and it's not true uh, in general, uh, because uh, these are called pure states, and these are states of non-interacting system. When, when system is non-interacting with uh, environment, then uh, it can be described by a uh, vector in Hilbert space. Uh, yeah, for example, zero state is some vector ones. But uh, you can also rewrite the same state as a matrix. You can uh, take cat and bra, and this cat bra gives you this kind of matrix. Yeah, you, it is because 1, 0 times 1, 0 conjugated. No, this is not this. Not this here. 1, 0, it gives matrix. 1, 0, 0, this. Uh, but this is still the same. This is, this is still a pure state. This is just change of notation. Yeah? You can write vector or the corresponding to this vector matrix. It is completely the same. But uh, using this notation, you see that that uh, there are more possibilities because you can have some arbitrary arbitrary Hermitian matrix. Uh, so uh, this kind of matrix where alpha, beta, gamma are some complex numbers, and uh, you see that. All states of this kind are possible to express in this uh, form, but not the opposite way. So, not all states in this uh, form 
are possible to express as a vector. So the pure states are some subclass of uh, mixed states. And uh, this uh, uh, notation with vectors is, uh, is applied only to pure states. Uh, for mixed states, we need to have some, uh, it is called density matrix. Um, example. It is an example of mixed state. Um, one half uh, cat zero bra zero, one half uh, cat one bra one. And this has this form of uh, matrix representation. And it is quite similar to this uh, pure state. Yeah, this is pure state, this is just state, uh, superposition of state zero and one. So this state is, uh, for example, the result of acting with Hadamard on zero state. Yeah? And this state can be uh, run down as a matrix and also as a vector. But these are completely different states. This state is pure, fully quantum state. This state is completely mixed, a uh, fully classical state. And the difference is, is quite subtle, uh, but you can think that this state is... Because in this state you have probability of one half to obtain zero or one, but in this state you also have prob probability of one half obtaining zero or one. Probability is the, the same. When you perform just a measurement of a zero and ones, both states give uh, exactly the same probability distributions. But this is superposition of zero and one, so it is kind of a, that in the same time it is zero and one, and this is kind of classical mixture. It is kind of a, like throwing a, a coin and flipping the coin, and you have probability one half obtaining zero and one half obtaining one. But this is not one and zero in the same time. At the same time, but this is just possibility to obtain this and this. So uh, this is completely classical. This is completely in the quantum. And there are also some states that are between these that are not uh, pure, but also not completely classical. And this process of uh, changing from fully quantum states to uh, classical states is called decoherence. So, if you want to have a quantum computer with a classical computer, we need to uh, be able to keep qubits as long as possible in this pure uh, set. Okay, there are also gate elements. Yeah? Because I showed that, for example, for uh, ions, we apply gate by applying some laser points. For example, uh, applying laser pools to ion uh, corresponds to applying this kind of gate. This is some gate, never mind. This, but the, this gate has some parameters, and these parameters correspond to uh, parameters of this pulse. So, for example, omega corresponds to intensity of this pulse, uh, t is time of applying this pulse, phi is uh, phase of this laser and so on and so on. So we need to tune our laser uh, to obtain parameters that give us uh, some gate that we want. For example, Hadamard. Yeah. For Hadamard, we need to have 1 over square root of 2 everywhere, so we need to somehow tune these parameters. But of course, uh, on the hardware level, we cannot uh, tune uh, perfectly time of applying laser, uh, intensity of laser, and so on. So, in all of these parameters, there are some uh, technical uh, um, uh, problems. So, at the end, the whole gate is not exactly uh, that we, the gate that we want, but some um, approximate gate. So, this is one source of errors, and also the same applies to two qubit gates. Uh, and also there is measurement error because uh, once again uh, as I showed uh, measuring state of ion 
is basically measuring of a photon. But this this device which uh, measure a photon, of course, also has some. Um, uh, it, it, is, it is not perfect, yeah. And uh, another way, you also another thing, you also need to have possibility to um, reconstruct from which ion this photon uh, came. Yeah. So this is also some another uh, problem. So all of these uh, technical issues uh, leads us to noise in our circuit. Um, so uh, there are some uh, endon correction schemes that allow us to correct our, our um, um, computation. So let's say we have at the sum, on the sum state of computations we have some state side, whatever, and then, okay, this state has some general form, alpha times zero plus beta times one, <coughs> and then some error occurs. For simplicity, we can, uh, uh, we can consider a bit flip error. So this is error uh, which, with some probability p, uh, apply not get. Yeah. So this is kind of uh, error, model of error, that with probability pi apply x gate, and with probability 1 minus pi apply nothing. Uh, so at the end, of course, we have something which is not exactly psi. Basically, it is a mixed state at the end. So what is the uh, solution? The easiest solution uh, would be uh, just to copy our state many times, yes, and then when we have many copy of our state, uh, then probability that uh, error occurs on all of uh, these copies is low, so uh, we can somehow um, correct this error. But as uh, uh, it was shown on previous talk. Uh, there is no common theorem, yeah? so uh, you cannot find uh, operations that allow us to copy unknown state uh, multiple times. So this is not the solution. Uh, there is other solution. We can introduce some auxiliary qubits in state zero. This, this new qubits, and then we can apply control node gate here and control node gate here, uh, and this change our state from alpha zero plus plus beta zero to alpha zero 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 plus beta one one one. So it is not cloning; it is uh, embedding our state in some uh, higher dimensional space. Uh, and now, if there is some error, uh, we focus on this bit flip error, mm, then after occurring of this error, we can uh, correct this error. So we know that at the beginning, at the beginning here, before error, we had three qubits, and all of qubits are or zeros or ones. So to check if there was some error, we can compare pairs of qubits to uh, check e if there are uh, equal or if there is something is fit. So we apply control not gate here and here. And you can see that applying these two control gates is basically equivalent of performing XOR operation on these two bits. Yeah? So 0, 0 gives 0, 1, 1 gives also uh, 0, but 0, 1 gives 1, and 1, 0 gives 1. So we can compare these two qubits, and the result of comparison, comparison is here. And 
then we can compare this pair of qubits and what was again? 0, 0 gives 0, 1, 1 gives also 0, but 0, 1 and 1, 0 gives 1. And then we perform measurements here. We have four possibilities, of course. And now we can, knowing this outcome, we can uh, correct our uh, state. So if here is 0 and here is 0, then it means that uh, there was no error. We, we can do nothing, so it is just okay. This state is the same as previous one. If there, if we obtain here uh, zero one, then we know that here we have one. So this pair of uh, qubits uh, is not the same. But we know that this pair of qubits is the same. So we know that uh, on this qubit uh, there was this uh, free uh, uh, atom. So we need to apply X gate here to, uh, uh, to, to, to cancel this error. And if we obtain 1 here and 0 here, then we know that that error was here, and we apply X gate to correct this error. And if, if we obtain 1 and 1, we know that error was uh, here, uh, and we need to apply X gate to correct this error. So this is very simple. Uh, error correction scheme uh, which can correct only uh, error in the form of uh, flipping uh, states so this error just may or may not flip this state but of course there are many other uh, errors you can have error that introduce some phase for example and there is an, another scheme to uh, correct also uh, errors with phase and many, many others. So, as you see, if you want to have a fault tolerant quantum computer, if you want to uh, be able to correct all possible errors, then to encode one logical qubit, you need many, 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 many physical qubits. Yeah? So, uh, this is a uh, kind of problem. And algorithms. Uh, so, assume that we have perfect quantum computer, that everything works, even if not, uh, then we can um, perform some simple algorithms. The uh, one of most famous is Grover algorithm. Grover algorithm uh, is also uh, um, showed as an algorithm for finding some element in, in some database, but it is not true because this is more algorithm for finding of some element with known uh, specification, let's say. Let's see example. Uh, we can try to solve a uh, Sudoku, but Sudoku 2 by 2 uh, on uh, this global algorithm. So this is binary Sudoku, which has just two solutions. You can have 0, 1, 1, 0, this is one solution, or uh, 1, 0, 1, 0, this is the second solution. And the task is to find uh, this solution. So let's assume that we don't know this solution. But we know that solution of Sudoku is something like that. Uh, that ha, um, it, it, it has to have uh, different bits in rows and columns of this diagram. Yeah? So this is our uh, characterization of our solution. And global algorithms allow us to find a solution. So we have 16 possible solutions. We know what is the uh, character of our a solution and we want to find it. And how it works? First of all, uh, we need four qubits because uh, we will uh, encode these solutions in basic state of qubits. So we have four qubits. We apply Hadamard gate on all qubits. And as you remember, Hadamard gate introduced superposition of 0 plus 1. 
So if you apply adamant clay everywhere, you obtain superposition of every possible basis state. Yeah? So you obtain superposition of 0, 0, 0, 0, plus 0, 0, 0, 1, plus 0, 0, 1, 0, and so on. Then you apply something called oracle. And this oracle is uh, something that uh, it marks a state that fulfills our, our condition. Uh, so we know that our state should have bits that are uh, different in rows and columns. So we need to somehow uh, implement some quantum circuit that uh, en encodes here this uh, logic of Sudoku. Yeah? It should be some uh, quantum circuit that encodes logic of Sudoku. Uh, let me leave this for now. Yeah, and this oracle, it is some unitary operation, unitary matrix, uh, as before, and this works in the following way. Uh, this oracle acting on solution uh, gives minus, and acting on other states uh, gives uh, one, nothing. Uh, but remember that oracle don't know explicitly what is solution, Oracle just know what is uh, the condition that solution should fulfill. Yeah? So uh, this is Grover on simple examples is uh, useless basically, but uh, uh, and then after Oracle we apply diffusion uh, or diff diff diffusion operator. Uh, this is some operator. It has this mathematical form, but right. this is uh, some operator that uh, amplifies uh, amplitude of states which were uh, chosen by this oracle. Yeah? So oracle uh, apply minus sign to this state which we want to obtain, and then diffusion amplifies this state. We will see in a moment how it works. And then uh, two, and then if we measure a uh, few uh, qubits, we have high probability, not, uh, it's not uh, for sure, but we have high probability that uh, we obtain here the solution of our problem. And to have the highest possible probability, we need to repeat this oracle and diffusion around square root of n times, where n is number of possible solutions, so in our case 16. So square root of 16 uh, times we can repeat this uh, algorithm. Uh, and this is why Grover gives us a quadratic speed. Yeah? We, because in classical way, we need to uh, check order of n solutions to find correct one. Here we need to check in, in, in the sense that apply this uh, block on the square root of n times. And now graphical visualization how it works, because it is easier. Let's imagine that we have some space and uh, states in this space. Before Arthur showed a block sphere, but you can, you can have some higher dimensional space. And in this space somewhere is our uh, solution, our target uh, state that corresponds to solution. And also there are some other basis states. Uh, Yeah, there are some other basic states, so this is our solution, let's say, and symbolically, and this is other states that are not solution. And these are, of course, orthogonal, because these all states are orthogonal. First, we apply this Hadamatz. Hadamatz introduces this superposition of all possible basic states, and it is some vector in this space, yeah, somewhere. Then we apply oracle. And what oracle does? Oracle change sign. Oracle change sign 
uh, in uh, these states which are correct. So, uh, because this is our correct state, and if we change sign of this state, and we don't change sign of this state, then uh, effectively it uh, is uh, it, it, it flips our state uh, around x axis. Uh, so we obtain this state. Then we apply diffusion, and diffusion is in geometrical interpretation. This diffusion is. Uh, uh, is rotating a, a vector around this uh, initial vector. So, after applying this gauge, we obtain this state. And as you see, we are closer to the target state than before. So, uh, applying this uh, Grover uh, algorithm, you can be closer and closer to the target state. So you have higher and higher probability of obtaining correct uh, solution. But you can, uh, but if you do too much, too many, uh, too many repetition of this algorithm, then you uh, are, uh, then you can cross this line, and then you are farther and farther from the solution. So you need to apply. Uh, uh, you need to find this this uh, uh, sweet spot to, to to apply correct number of um, uh, steps. Of course, then it, it basically rotates. So after many 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 steps, it comes back. But it is uh, oh, and now exercise. Uh, we perform Grover algorithm. We start with uh, applying Hadamard gates. And the question is, what is the probability of obtaining basis states after this step? Yeah. So we are, we are after this step. And what is now the probability of obtaining here 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, yeah. So, so let's let's uh, let's do it and uh, let's think about it. What is the probability of obtaining basis states after this step of algorithm? So let me start this. Okay, so you can choose between A and B. Okay, unfortunately, A is not B. Uh, 
a because as I said a Hadama introduced superposition of all uh, basis sets. So uh, Hadamat acting on one state gives superposition of zero and one, and uh, similarly two Hadamats acting on two zeros gives superposition of zero zero plus zero one plus one zero plus one one and so on. So applying uh, Hadamat on all qubits you introduce superposition with equal uh, amplitude of k should be one half because you have one over square root of two from each hadamat. So after n hadamat, you have here one over square root uh, to the power of n. Okay. So a is correct answer. Uh, then we apply second step of uh, Grover algorithm, we apply oracle. And now the same question, which uh, histogram is a uh, uh, histogram showing a uh, probability of obtaining basis states. The answers are, are the same. You can choose now which, which histogram is uh, correct after oracle. So the same. Another question, the same answers. You can why okay so you, you need to very fast answer a or b yeah again a again a why because oracle change only sign of, of, of state. And these are probabilities, so probability is modulo to the power of two. So minus or plus whatever. And if you see yeah. Oracle just put minus before solutions and nothing before everything else. So it doesn't change the probability distribution. Okay. So we had Hadamard, then we had Oracle, and now we have diffusion. And once again, which histogram is correct after applying diffusion? So let me start. I don't know, maybe fifteen seconds, maybe sixteen or sixty. Oh, one minute. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yes, finally B, finally B, because the diffusion uh, was visible here. Oracle just uh, changed the sign, but diffusion uh, rotates this vector closer to the target. So the, uh, now the uh, probabilities are higher for here are these states which are solutions. Yeah, so 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, and this stage uh, have higher probability. Okay, so let's go further. Let's apply Oracle once again. And now you have these two possible answers. A and B. After applying Hadamard's Oracle, diffusion and Oracle once again. Here is higher difference between these two states and this and other states. So here and here are the same states are picked, but here you have lower probabilities of other states, and here you can lower than this, but higher than this probability of this state. <coughs> And this histogram is the same as previous one. Yeah? So the same histogram was after uh, these steps. Now, uh, yeah, it is still B because Oracle introduced one sign, it is squared, so sign doesn't matter, so it is still B. Okay, so now apply once again diffusion, and what is the answer?
Yes, it is. Okay? Because, as previously, uh, diffusion uh, give, gives us a vector that is closer to the solution. So, after repeating this Grover algorithm, we has higher, we have higher probability of correct solutions than before. Yeah. But, uh, I, I don't want to go further, but if you apply this one again, okay, uh, then uh, it should be decreasing, because you, you, yeah, you are going back. Okay, and short algorithm. Uh, this is an uh, algorithm that gives us exponential speed up, not quadratic speed up. And this algorithm is uh, usually uh, used for uh, factorization of numbers. So we have some number n, and we want to uh, factorize it to some factors p and q. And there is classical algorithm to uh, do it. Uh, and the shore is actually only a part of this classical algorithm. So, uh, at the beginning we use classical algorithm, we choose a random sum A between 2 and N, and we uh, compute a greatest common divisor of A and S. It is easy to do uh, classically. And if it is not 1, then we have solution, yeah? because if it is not 1, then mm, P is uh, this and Q is this and the end of the word. But uh, if we found uh, such A that it gives uh, 1, then mm, we can introduce this kind of a function. Here is this A to the power of some R and this A to the power of R modulus N is equal 1. And uh, the, the task is to find this R. So we need to find R uh, to find P and Q at the end. Uh, and short algorithm is specifically to finding this R. So a short algorithm is uh, for finding period of function, because this function is periodical. So using short algorithm, we, we can find uh, this uh, R. So here is uh, yeah, short gives this R, and then when we uh, have R, we can take a to the R minus one. It should be zero modulo n, and, and then we can decompose this, assuming that R is even. Yeah, if R is odd, then we need to restart our algorithm. So uh, we, 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 we hope that we find uh, R which is even, and then we can decompose this in this way. And then you can compute greatest common divisor of N and this expression, and it is also easy classically. And if uh, D is not equal 1, then you find solution. Then P is equal D, and Q is equal N over D. So, this is classically easy, this is classically easy, this is classically hard, and so is to uh, improve uh, our algorithm in this step of finding this uh, function. Let's see example. We can, we want to factorize 15. We choose a equal to. Uh, and now we need to find some circuit that uh, implements this uh, uh, multiplication modulo n. So we need to find some circuit that applying on state x gives uh, state a times x modulo n. And we will encode states as a binary representation. So you asking on state 1001, it is like a multiplication of 9, because this is 9, times 2 modulo 15, and this is 3, so this is state 0, 0, 1, 1. Yeah. So we need to find some U that works in this way for all uh, basic states. 
And this is the task we want to do. Which of these circuits do this? And, uh -huh. and uh, what is this something like this? Uh, this is so called swap gate. Swap gate swaps qubits. Uh, so this gate just swaps these qubits. Yeah? So uh, if you had uh, so U swap acting on 0, 0 gives 0, 0, acting on 0, 1 gives 1, 0, acting on 1, 0 gives 0, 1, and acting on 1, 1 gives 1, 1. So we just swap uh, the qubits. And you have different combinations of swap gates. And of course, in general, you need to uh, design these gates. Uh, for a arbitrary uh, base state, but it is simplified that only only one of these gates uh, circuits uh, corresponds to this specific operation. So only in one of these uh, answers, if you put here one zero zero one, uh, then you obtain at the end zero zero one. And time, time is running, I think, yeah, time is running, so... Uh, you can choose between A, B, C, D. Check this. Okay. And then uh, there is another uh, algorithm that is uh, that, that we need to use to use to perform short algorithm. It is called quantum phase estimation. Uh, I don't want to get to the detail, but this algorithm allows us to find phase of eigenvalue of state of u. And so, uh, if we apply u on some uh, eigenstate, we obtain eigenstate uh, multiplied by, multiplied by uh, eigenvalue. And because of u is unitary, these eigenvalues are uh, on the unit circle, uh, uh, on the complex plane. So, they are in the form of e to the 2 pi i something, and quantum phase estimation is quantum algorithm that allows us to find this Q over R, this, this something in this, in, the, in this phase. And, and, and you can show that this is exactly this R which we are looking for. Yeah, so 
I don't want to, to go to the details. But after applying uh, this phase estimation, you obtain something like that, that you have uh, non-zero probability of obtaining state 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. And this, these results uh, are, uh, yeah, these are four non-zero states, and these results correspond to this kind of uh, floating numbers. Yeah? So 0, 0, 0 corresponds to 0, this corresponds to 0 0.25, this is 0 0.5, this is 0 0.75. Uh, and knowing these this fractions, we can guess what is R. Because it, we, we, it can be shown that uh, each this phase is in the form something over R, and we obtain this kind of results. So we can guess what is R, and this is the task for you to guess what is the more the most probable are. Time is running out. So you can choose ABCD, two, four, eight, four, six. Guessing, it is not not fully uh, deterministic. And then, when we have R equal to four, we uh, compute P and Q and obtain P equal three, Q equal five. So we factorize fifteen to three times five. And this is more or less what is currently possible on quantum computer today. So you can factorize fifteen. So now subdivision. Um, we have many problems. Uh, first of all, quantum computer gives us speed up only for some tasks. So, quantum computer uh, in, in principle can uh, uh, compute arbitrary computation. So, uh, you, you can express all of classical computations as quantum computations, but it is uh, not uh, efficient in uh, most of the cases, so we have speed up only for some tasks, for Grover for finding uh, something, short for finding a period of function, and so on. But there is another problem, that even if we have this uh, speed up, then we need to find practical application, because uh, factorizing 15 is not very practical application. 
uh, solving Sudoku 2 by 2 is also not very practical application. Uh, so, uh, yeah. so we have speed up, but we need to. So we have some success, but we need to find uh, the reason for this success. Uh, yeah, and 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 one other thing: conversion between classical and quantum data, uh, because. Here we assume that we have some quantum register and we apply operation and we measure this register. But in general, uh, you, if you work on classical data, you need to first encode classical da da data on quantum register, then perform something, and then uh, extract classical information from quantum register. And even if uh, the algorithm is uh, more efficient than the classical one, then you usually uh, have no efficient way to encode classical data in quantum register and then encode classical data from quantum register. Yeah? So uh, it, it should work the best for uh, quantum data. Yeah? If, you, if you have somehow uh, say quantum data, then uh, it is more um, reasonable to use quantum algorithms, but not always for classical data. And that's all. <laughs>